So this was a conversation between Michael Levin and Ricard Soleil. Michael Levin's page here, the Michael Levin's academic content, is absolutely just cranking out fantastic conversations with super interesting guests. Would strongly recommend checking that one out. We'll share a link to it in the essay and in the description. We'll also shared a link to just a couple of papers that Michael Levin has recently shared. Okay, so three important tidbits, things to know before the essay. First one is synthetic biology, second one is morphospace or morphospaces, and the third one is cybernetics. So synthetic biology is designing and creating new biological parts, devices or systems, or redesigning existing ones for useful purposes. This is a lot of the work that they're doing in uh, either of their respective labs and with their research teams. Morphospace is... There it is. Morphospace is a way of imagining all possible shapes or structures that could exist in living things, even if they don't exist in nature yet. This is important in trying to design artificial intelligent systems, and this is a big part of Ricard's work. And then the third tidbit important to know is cybernetics. So cybernetics is the study of how systems, uh, living or machine systems, control and communicate with each other. So rather than me try to explain each of these in any great detail, which I'm not qualified to do, I'll just share two experiments that were discussed in this recent conversation because I think that they highlight quite well uh, the material. So the first one is Ant School for Bacteria. So this is an ongoing project by Ricard. I'll share the video now. And there are crazy projects that's still ongoing. Um, one of my preferred projects that uh, has <laughs> been working around for years because, you know, as you know, when you go into experiments, it's not, not trivial to get there is the possibility of um, implementing, uh, using bacteria, implementing um, new rules of interaction that made our bacteria behave like ants, ants in, as in ant colonies. Mm -hmm. Of course, ants, ants use these specific rules of building morphogenetic fields, et cetera, because then collectively they can solve problems. And in bacteria, um, you see kind of preconditions of that, you know, current sensing, you know, all the things that are, can be identified in ant colonies, but not the whole story. And you can ask our, yourself, well, why is not there? Um, it might be, it might be, you haven't seen it, but why is not there? And, and one thing. I had a great image of a sketch comparing an ant brain and the neurons with a human brain, but I've lost it. I'll share it in the in the essay. So basically, if you were a curious child, you're almost certainly familiar with some of the peculiar behaviors of ants, or ant colonies more specifically. Uh, they're one of nature's most interesting demonstrations of what we might call emergence. So individual ants, they follow simple hardwired rules. They follow pheromone trails. They react to the presence of food. They avoid obstacles. And they communicate with each other through touch and chemical signal. And there's no top-down command. This is the interesting part. It's like a decentralized system. They miraculously, collectively execute complex collective tasks. So they build intricate nests, they defend the colony, and they find the shortest path to food scraps. Now, the interesting thing, which was part of the experiment done by Ricard, is that bacteria do not share this same, uh, this same phenomenon. So Ricard Sol is currently undertaking a project that he was just talking about there in the video where he's attempting to implement the sort of collective behavior you see in ant colonies in bacteria. So now let me share one more experiment. And so Michael Levin is doing a similar but different experiment with immortal worms. Well, they're actually flatworms or planaria. He's done a lot of work here uh, in this particular experiment, I don't know if it's the one here in the image, but in this experiment that he referenced in the conversation, they take uh, genetically normal flatworms, they manipulate the bioelectric circuits. So they play around with the bioelectricity, which is this whole new field of study and interest. 
basically the electricity that runs between cells throughout the body, not just in the brain. And they're able to manipulate that bioelectric signal so that the planarians can regenerate new heads resembling new species, which is just fucking wild. So the work by both of these guys that you see here on screen. Dun, dun, dun. So this is challenging our existing understanding of both intelligence and consciousness, consciousness. So a few of the additional big ideas from the conversation, I'll just share a few of them now. The first is just about this synthetic biology and where it might take us. With Brian Goodwin at the Open University, there was people there were kind of trying to figure out um, what could be the role of bioelectricity but it was considered a totally marginal and uh, you know yeah. speculative matter but uh, it's clear the potential even for for genetic new form of genetic attractors it's yeah. it's quite a thing i mean um it's one of the things that when you read the papers is uh, you you ask yourself now now what's next because uh, we are finding out the potential that was totally unexpected yeah so my apologies i shared the wrong description so that one is about these fringe ideas that are now becoming mainstream so ideas that were once considered marginal or speculative things like bioelectricity are now seen as important in understanding new forms of intelligence and they have some pretty big implications on consciousness as well basically all of life bioelectricity being the big one discussed here Next idea is to do with the top-down, bottom-up approach, which has a lot to do with building artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, as, as you know, my, my thinking is that we're going to have to do what we've done for, you know, millennia in, in neuroscience, which is to uh, try to control it top down, incentivizing training. You know, I, I, I agree with you. I think I think this kind of bottom up um, tinkering is going to be very, very difficult in the long term. Um, you know, and and yeah. I think I think we yeah, we, we have some opportunities now to discover, you know, does do, do these systems, which I think they do, but to, to really understand what are the interfaces that they give us for top down control, right, to make them basically, you know, reset the set points and, and, and make them motivated in effect to to do the so the way that i in interpret this especially in reference to artificial intelligence is it's kind of like it's easy to sculpt a statue from a big block of stone rather than it is to build it up from tiny pebbles and so the big question at the moment is are we going to be able to regenerate human like intelligence in an artificial intelligence system even though we don't fully understand intelligence and the impression I get from these guys is I think it's going to be quite a complex undertaking. The last two that I won't share because I'm running out of time in the video were about complexity and living systems. So they discuss at length and they compare how things work uh, in terms of software evolving. So through small changes and copying what works, this is, this is different. So evolution works a little bit different to how we typically design machines or computers. So it's questioning whether we truly can engineer uh, artificial systems in the same way that evolution engineers human systems or biology. And then the final, toward the end of the conversation, they have a really interesting uh, d discussion about language and language versus communication. They explore the idea that there is a gradual progression or there might be a gradual progression from simple signaling to complex language and biological systems. And so better understanding how we move from communication to language might, gives us un might give us some insight into how we understand complex behaviors. So my final thoughts on this conversation were about the mysteries of mind and consciousness. So mysteries of intelligence and consciousness, they continue to deepen beyond grasp. It's still a very open question as to what these things really are, what the true nature of consciousness is, how intelligence works. So the story that I find most compelling at the moment is one in which we, rather than try to get to the bottom of these things, we rather redefine our understandings of these concepts. So I think experiments like these, that these guys are doing in the lab, um, we're lucky to have them doing these and translating and testing some of these abstract theories 
uh, into real biological experiments. So this is ultimately where we'll see most of the shifts in framing of the big questions. I'll share this conversation in the essay and in the description.